Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Today, we're coming to you both from the beautiful Reading with Your Kids studios in Reedville, Massachusetts, and also from Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California, where we had the pleasure of interviewing Father Greg Boyle, the founder of Homeboy Industries, the, the largest gang intervention program in the world, and also the author of Tattoos on the Heart and also Barking to the Choir. We will also be speaking with our friend Leslie Wall. As I said, this is a special edition of the podcast, special mainly because I have a chance to, um, to, to interview one of my favorite authors, and he's not a, a children's author per se, but as you will hear, I really believe that both of his books, Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir, would be fantastic books for families to experience together, especially families of kids in high school and also kids in middle school, too. Very, very powerful books. And, and I've wanted to have a chance to speak with Father Greg for, for some time. And I had the opportunity. It just kind of things just kind of landed into place. We had been back and forth trying to schedule a one of our typical Skype interviews and uh, it just so happened that uh, when I, my wife and I were going out to Los Angeles to attend the iHeart Radio Podcast Awards, uh, Father Greg had an opening and so I went, I had a chance to tour uh, the, uh, the Homeboy Industries and was just blown away with all the wonderful, wonderful things that's happening there. Now one of the things you may notice is that uh, our conversation with Father Greg is uh, relatively short compared to some of the other interviews that we have here on the podcast. Now, I could have spoken to Father Greg all afternoon, and he certainly seemed willing to speak to me as long as I had questions. But I knew there was a long line of people who were desperately waiting to, to speak to Father Greg, and I knew that Father Greg was very anxious to be able to serve them. And I'm kind of glad we did that because this gives me an opportunity to invite Leslie Wall. And you remember Leslie Wall. She's on the show a lot sharing with us her, her great suggestions for middle grade and also YA titles that Catholic families and Christian families and other families might enjoy co-reading with their kids. So Leslie's going to come in. I asked her to sit down and read Barking with the Choir and to give us her thoughts. And she will be sharing those thoughts with us later on. By the way, you will hear me refer to the audio editions of Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir and my conversation with Father Greg and Leslie. I really think that it's an incredibly powerful way to experience the stories uh, found in both books. Father Greg does a narration, does an incredible job. And if you would like to receive a free copy of the audio version of either Tattoos on the Heart or Barking to the Choir, you can get that by going to audibletrial.com slash respect. audibletrial.com slash respect. When you go there and sign up for Audible's free 30-day trial membership, you can download a copy of Barking to the Choir or Tattoos on the Heart or any one of over 100,000 other titles. Now, if you cancel your trial anytime during that first 30 days, you owe absolutely nothing. And that audiobook that you download is yours to keep for free. AudibleTrial.com slash respect. So I'm here with Father Greg Boyle, the author of Tattoos on the Heart and also Barking to the Choir. And Father Greg is signing some books right now as we're speaking. Um, I, I, I wanted to invite you on the the reading with your kids podcast first because i thought that both tattoos on the heart and barking to the choir would be great books for parents to read with their older kids co-reading with them and 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 talking about it but as i was re-listening to barking to the choir yesterday i thought how much it resembled all of the children's books that i that, that we talk about here on the podcast because the book, while there's, there's obviously tragedy and pain, there's also a lot of hope. And a lot of the messages that you're sharing in the book are the messages that the authors of our children's books are talking to kids about, about accepting people, diversity, um, being caring for one another. And that's certainly the message in both of your books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, and... You know, of course, you won't find a lot of that language in children's books. Sure. But um, 
Yeah, and a lot, a lot of times they're parables. Mm-hmm. You know, they're kind of stories and the moral of the story. People, I don't write that way, but you can kind of uh, say, oh, this is about compassion and this is about kinship and this is about we belong to each other. And so there's, you can always kind of draw those kinds of conclusions as well, which is a nice thing to be able to do. Mm-hmm, absolutely. That was one of the things that said, struck me and moved me that idea of radical kinship how do you think parents can kind of share that with their young kids well i think uh, parents can do this by challenging their kids because we're we're um we're human beings and so naturally we draw lines Mm -hmm. us them they belong to our group they don't belong to our group this is a bad person we keep that person out and so the more uh, parents can get their kids to see in a different way, well, obviously we're all going to be better off because mm-hmm. then you're going to um, be able to um, erase margins and erase mm-hmm. boundaries and imagine a circle of compassion. And then your kids are going to be able to imagine nobody standing outside that circle. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal. I mean, in the end, you can draw a straight line from... Uh, from that issue, mm-hmm. the drawing of lines, and every single social ill we face, you know, from uh, the current uh, government shutdown to mm-hmm. uh, immigration issues to the racial divide, they all they all kind of rest on that notion that. Uh, Somehow there's an us and a them, mm-hmm. and and we all have to win, and 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 if we have to win, then that means somebody has to lose. Right. And so uh, these are dangerous kinds of concepts, I think. Yeah, I I agree, and unfortunately, one of the things that's just discouraging for me as a Catholic, as someone who went to a Jesuit school. Where'd you go? Boston College High School. Oh, my gosh. I've spoken there. I mean, you're going to be there in April. That's right, yeah. (laughs) Um, But those lines seem to be... A a lot of folks who call themselves Christians and Catholics are the ones with the the brightest markers drawing those lines between people. Well, I, I, I think... That requires a new way of uh, seeing. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between orthopraxis and orthodoxy. You know, mm-hmm. people who think it has to look this way, it has to be this way. Ortho, orthodoxy people uh, draw lines, but orthopraxis people try to erase them. Mm-hmm. And so, the invitation of the orthopraxis person is to is to live as though the truth were true and to be anchored in the gospel and to somehow um, move the dial to, to another place, mm-hmm. you know, to somehow um, um, I don't know put first things recognizably first and, and that's that's the hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things I, I love in, in both of the books is the idea of just recognizing and seeing the God that's living inside all of us. Yeah, it, it wants to uh, propose something more spacious and expansive, an understanding. So we settled for a tiny and a puny and a vindictive and a punitive God. And basically the God created in our own image. Mm-hmm. And, and so the invitation is to move beyond that to something um, more broad and mm-hmm. uh, expansive as I said and, yeah. and and something that is more inclusive so I think there's nothing more consequential in the world than how how we see God mm-hmm. you know because you know you're kind of doomed to uh, to imitate the kind of God you believe in mm-hmm. and if and if your God is puny and tiny then that's what's going to happen, and that's 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 how you will see. But you know, here we deal with gang members, and so the notion here is about trying to get underneath um, 
criminality, if mm-hmm. you will, and, and how are we to see it and how are we to understand it and uh, so that we can get underneath it and have a different diagnosis than the one that we you know, always embrace. Mm-hmm. One of the things I had uh, the pleasure of taking, uh, just finishing a tour here of, of Homeboy Industries, and one of the things that struck me is the joy that I experienced with everybody that we met. There's just this, uh, there's constant hugging and smiling and, <laughs> you know, things that people won't necessarily think about when they're thinking, uh, well, my wife who's back at the hotel when she hears homeboy, it's like no, 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 that's not for me I'm I, I'm staying here I'm staying here in the Marriott <laughs> how did you I know it's love it's acceptance, but how are you, were you able to succeed in, in bringing that joy here where a lot of other programs aren't able to be successful I, you know I don't know if it's a thing I do you know I think this is a sacred place I think it's created uh, a community of tenderness that's quite compelling and people feel it the second they walk in and uh, and it's a foreign thing you know John Vanier says that um, uh, tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity so this place kind of invites the world to to become that so mm-hmm. it wants to be what it thinks the world is invited to become and uh, so so you can feel it here mm-hmm. it otherwise nothing works you can't deliver services unless it's a place of tenderness and trust and where people feel safe mm-hmm. and, and so that's kind of what this place offers and once once they can enter and inhabit that that sacred place of where people feel safe and valued and and there's trust then they can you know inhabit the truth of who they are that they're exactly what god had in mind Mm -hmm. when god made them so then they become that self and then they can leave here after 18 months resilient people and they can embrace the adventure, which is the world out there. Yeah. And then now they know how to navigate all the crises of intimacy and mm-hmm. generativity and all the things that are going to get thrown at them, and they won't get toppled by it this time. Yeah. If a parent is out there thinking, gee, I, I don't know if this is something that I want to co-read with my kids or listen to in the car, the audio version of either of your books, what would you say to, to maybe encourage them and kind of uh, give them a, a second way of looking at that? The teenagers will like it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's kind of raw and real and, uh, you know, and it's funny mm-hmm. and heartbreaking and and it's uh, I wouldn't say I wrote it for them but it's certainly accessible to them mm-hmm. absolutely well, one of the things that, that um, I, I that struck me again yesterday as I was uh, listening on the plane coming back was um, I, th- I think I get the quote right um, uh, Every once in a while, a crazy old lady might drop a few turds in your basket, but that doesn't mean you have to <laughs> eat it. <laughs> uh, let me just say that that quote <laughs> deserves a context. Thank you very much. Well, would you like to provide the context? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, it's a story about a uh, well, well, brother Jesuit of mine, Mark Torres, who I just saw walk by, who works here, and he... Um, he was a kid, and he said he was always kind of the Charlie Brown of kids in costumes. He was the last kid to get to the door mm-hmm. for the candy, and he did it, this one thing. And this woman said, oh, my God, I've run out of candy. And then she says, oh, no, wait a minute. Titi's tutus, she says. And he thinks to himself, Titi's tutus. And all of a sudden she comes back, and she drops some something in his bag. And... And then a dog barks, and she goes, Titi, shush. <laughs> and uh, he gets back at the end of the day, and this woman has deposited in his bag two very firm 
dog turds. And there was some moral of that story somewhere in there, which you just quoted. <laughs> but it's more about being curious about the things that happen to us rather than horrified. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a good idea. Absolutely. Well, I certainly <clears throat> think that uh, Tattoos in a Heart and Barking to the Choir would be great additions to any family library. And I especially um, would recommend the audio version. Uh, because you're narrating it and uh, you can feel the emotion. Um, you, it sounds like you're reliving the stories as, you, as you're telling them. Um, well, the stories, you know, they were, they were all part of talks I've given mm -hmm. before they ever got to the page. So I kind of know, know the stories uh, pretty inside and out. Mm -hmm. Very few are ones that I've never told. And um, so I know every... A crevice and corner and uh, so I'm not really reading the stories when I do the audio versions because I, I know I've, I've, I've spoken these stories and I kind of know how to do them so yeah. um. but it, as, as I was telling the folks on my on my tour is that that emotion comes out and that uh, authentic, authenticity comes out and it's I think it would be something from, that would be difficult for me to kind of imagine through the written word. Well, initially, you know, they, they had scheduled four days to do, tape this somewhere in, like, crazy place, like Maine or something. Uh -huh. And then um, I, uh, I didn't have four days in a row, and they said, well, we'll get, you know, George Clooney to do it or something. <laughs> And I said, no, nobody's going to do these other than me, just because I just know these stories so well. Mm -hmm. So um, so they ended up finding four days somewhere in L.A., actually, so that, that kind of helped, helped me out a little bit. So. Well, I really appreciate the time that, that you gave me today. Um, I look forward to um, seeing you in Boston. Mm -hmm. I, my friend Grace told me that I'll be her special guest when you come to oh, good. Uh, good. BC High. So, um, thanks your very alma much. Mater. Yes, Father yeah. Greg Boyle here on the um, Reading with Your Kids podcast. Thanks very much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Father Greg Boyle. Our friend Leslie Wall will be here in just a moment to tell us her thoughts on Barking to the Choir. Um, I, 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 I'm about to reread Barking to the Choir with my niece. And we're really looking forward to it. And this will be the first time I'm, I'm reading the book. We're reading it aloud, so we'll be hearing each other's tone of voice. I, as I mentioned, I experienced both Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir in, initially as audiobooks. And if you would like to receive a free copy of the audio version of either book, you can go to audibletrial.com slash respect, audibletrial.com slash respect. Sign up for this free 30-day trial membership, and you can download either Tattoos on the Heart or Barking to the Choir for free. And if you already have those books, you can download any one of over 100,000 titles that are available on Audible. Audibletrial.com slash respect. Cancel any time during that first 30 days and you'll owe absolutely nothing. And you get to keep the audiobook forever. Audibletrial.com slash respect. We're really excited. This is such an exceptional episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. I decided to bring in my uh, our good friend Leslie Wall, who is an award winning uh, author of, uh, of books for uh, uh, young adults, and she is a Catholic and she writes Catholic themed books. And I thought, who better than to chat uh, about Father Greg's books than with Leslie Wall? So, welcome back to the show, our friend Leslie Wall. Leslie, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. This book was just so amazing. Just so many things I want to chat about. Yeah, awesome. Well, you know, we, we were talking to Father Greg in this episode, and I thought this would be fun to to talk to a, a, a fellow Catholic author uh, about this whole idea. One of the things I brought up to Father Greg is I know he didn't write, and we're talking about the book Barking to the Choir, and I know he didn't write that with uh, teenagers in mind or middle schoolers in mind, but I, as I was reading it, uh, the one thing I thought of was this: this would have been a book that I would have loved 
as a, uh, a student at a Catholic high school in Boston. I would have loved reading this, and I would have loved to have uh, sat down and read this book aloud with my son when he was in middle school and high school. Unfortunately, it wasn't available. So what was your take on it? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that because there were so many insights uh, into these teens and young adults and adults, too, that uh, were in the gang system. And the, uh, and to just see a different perspective uh, would be so great for kids to see because you can really relate in a different way. And sure, you have to be cautious, but to know that everybody is a child of God and they all have... Uh, wonderful things about them, but some of them have horrible backgrounds. And I think uh, this would be a great book for people to, especially kids, to understand that difference. Yeah, yeah. And and it's, you know, going in, I th- we talked a little bit about it with, with Father Greg. Um, both of his books, Tattoos on the Heart and Barking to the Choir, um, if, if, if you have this typical image of a Catholic priest or of a minister or of a rabbi, of a quote-unquote uh, a clergy person, uh, you might be surprised by some of the language. It's not something that you find in a typical, I don't think you find it in any middle grade book or a typical uh, YA book. But it's real. It's not out of context. It's not used um, in anything other than a genuine way, I think. Yeah, I wasn't... The first little bit, I was a little surprised. I was like, oh. But, you know, that's how he is able to relate to these uh, kids and make a difference. And there was something he said in there about um, someone asked him, how do you reach them? How do you preach to them? And he's like, you know, I basically, you know, he just is with them. He's Mm -hmm. just part of them. And he's just because of their interaction together and that they feel uh, somebody cares about them is how he makes a difference. He's not, you know, pounding them on the head with scripture and stuff. He's just part of their life and there for them. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can take from Barking to the Choir that, for, for you know, most people aren't serving in, um, in downtown L.A. They're not working with gang members and that, that, you know, probably not coming in contact with gang members. But I think a lot of the wisdom that he shares is relevant to our day to day life. And I think a lot of it is relevant to our lives as parents when and when and how we react and interact with our kids. Yeah, yeah that, he had something. Uh, one of his things, I wrote a bunch of them down because he had so many great uh, quotes that he had. Uh, one was don't try to save the world, instead savor it. And I just thought that was great because saving the world is kind of about you. Mm-hmm. And instead connect with people as humans, and that's how you can kind of make the difference. And I can also be with parents and child, uh, siblings, people at school, and just all the marginalized people. You know, just we all are human, and to be able to connect with people that way is such a good message. Yeah, absolutely. I- one of the things you were talking about, quotes, um, and, and I want to hear more of the quotes that, that kind of spoke to you directly, but one of the ones that, that really touched me and it, it had an interesting experience reading. Well, I, I, I went with the audio version of the book, and I loved it because it was Father Greg, and it was in his own voice. And... Uh, I would read the book, I would listen to the book oftentimes at the gym and I would be laughing out loud in some sh- sections. And then just a couple of minutes later, I'd be, we, you know, trying hard not to let anybody hear me cry. <laughs> and, and a lot of the things I cried at, it wasn't, it wasn't either, there's certainly some really tragic stories there that are, are heartbreaking. But there, there are some quotes and just some reminders of, of how much God loves us and, one of the ones that really stuck out to me was God is way, and I'm not quoting this directly, but God is way too busy loving you to ever have time to be disappointed in you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that's a good one. Like I said, he had so many, but um, I think that was the message that he loves everybody. He's 
just there wanting to love us all mm-hmm. and he's not judging like so much he's just there for us mm-hmm. you know you're right it was some moments where you're just laughing at some of the things and then others yeah you were just like oh so taken aback by it yeah yeah now as a as a, a YA author yourself what did you come away with any any kind of um, authory kind of outlooks from it? I, that's a dumb question, but <laughs> I, I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, this book was very interesting because it's uh, just tiny little snippets, mm-hmm. little paragraphs about his little experiences with um, these homies, as he calls them, and these gang members. So it's each chapter is kind of just around one theme, uh, but it's not like a long story, just very tiny little pieces that all kind of around the same thing. I just thought that was really an intriguing way to write it and simple for people to just get these little snippets, but you still get the whole message too. I, I thought he had a really interesting writing style, and I don't know if his, I hadn't read his other book, I don't know if it's similar in that way, but yeah. it's an easy way for anybody to pick it up and read little bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it and tattoos on the heart. It it is similar um, in that way. Um, I, I think I found barking to the choir just a little bit more. I don't know if intimate is the right word, but we. we I, I, th- I think it's more kind of uh, relational and, and talking about more on a deeper level some of the relationships he has with the homies. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's neat. And one thing that stuck out, I was so impressed that he takes these, uh, he takes them on trips to go speak with people. And I thought, what a great way, instead of him just telling people about it, uh, these former gang members are there really explaining their lives to law enforcement and to counselors and to all these people. It just really affects them, I think, on how they will deal in the future with uh, people in the gangs to know that their background is something that we don't know much about. And, you know, their background put them in this situation oftentimes. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing too, be, be even beyond that. And I, I think one of the valuable lessons that, that we as parents can, can kind of share with our kids as, and, and this is definitely a book that I think we sh- we be so powerful to read, co-read with our kids. Or listen to the audio version together on the way to school um, or on the way to dance or whatever. But one of the things that this, this that happens when we hear this, the life stories and the backstories of these gang members, of these people who've made horrible mistakes in their lives and in and, and, and many cases have hurt others in tremendous ways, when we hear the backstories and we see them as human beings, we see them in a different way. And I think it's important for us to to help remind our kids that I, I think we have a responsibility to, to see everybody in our life as a human being and to take – because when we label someone a gang member, a uh, criminal, an alien, a, a Protestant, a, whatever, whatever kind of label it is we put on them – it's it has a dehumanizing effect, and I think one of the things as parents we need to teach our kids to see beyond those labels and to see the human being that's in front of us. Absolutely, I thought that was a huge part of the book, and really it's a Christian thing. Sure, we know we're supposed to help everyone, be kind, but you do kind of isolate yourself and and um, put labels on people. But that is not what Jesus did. He wanted to reach out to everybody, to the poor and to the orphans. And and they all have a story. And that's what was amazing, that we can all are in this together, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the theme that, that runs through the entire book, that, that theme of radical kinship. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just... as As a performer, you know, I've been in, in situations where you know you have have a, a cast that comes together for six weeks six months a year a couple of years and they're all these different people but they're they're thrown into the situation when they need to work together and they become 
a bond and they do experience that kind of radical kinship. And, and if it's something that we can experience and bring to all the aspects of our lives, whether it's school or our team or, you know, just the way we, we interact with people on our job, it's, I, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I sound like someone, you know, you know uh, kind of pie in the sky, but what a beautiful world it would be. You're right. And you have those moments even in little things like, you're stuck in an airplane that's not going off. Suddenly you become friendly with the people around you and it's not just the stranger. Suddenly you have this little kinship. Yeah, I think it's, that was such a great thing that instead of connecting, uh, instead of saving the world, it's about connecting with people and the kinship is really matters and makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's and and I love that you reminded me that, that that about that whole difference between saving the world and and connecting with the world, saving the world and savoring the world. Um, I, I and it's something I was definitely guilty of, especially when I was younger. That whole idea of I'm going to go out and save the world. I know, and and especially as a, a kid at Catholic school, and you know, oh, I know what I, I hear Jesus, and I hear I know how Jesus wants us to act. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to save the world. And and meanwhile, I'm forgetting that that's that's his job. That's <laughs> it's Jesus' job. He he doesn't want me to do that. He wants me to connect. With every person I meet, make those connections. And if it's with one person, five people or ten people, just yeah. to see that, to see Jesus in everybody that we meet. Yeah, and in just tiny little things, there was one little blurb that um, one of the gang members, former gang members, was on a bus. And, um, and somebody said something just kind of kind to him. And it made such a difference that it was like, wow, they saw me for me, not who they thought I was is this, you know, looking like a strange, scary man or something. Uh, I thought that just was neat that it made such a difference that someone said something kind, that we can do that so easily throughout our entire day. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it really is true. And it, it, and you don't have to be interacting with a, with a gang member or somebody who's suffering. You know, every, I, I do this. It drives my wife crazy sometimes. You know, but you're, when, when you're in line at the supermarket or whatever and, 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 the, and the cashier says, hi, sir, how are you today? And because that's what they're trained to do. And mm. they hear the same response. Good. How are you? I always throw it, change it up. And I'm like, I am fantastic. How was you? Just say something <laughs> that's unexpected. And you know that you're catching them off guard because they stop and they look at you and they smile. And, and it's like. Okay, we've we've made a connection here. Um, the other day, I was at the, uh, I was checking in. I had my my annual physical, and I was checking in. And the woman said, uh, "What's your date of birth?" And she started looking at, it and she had a perplexed, and she hadn't even looked up to me the whole time I was there. And she looked at the screen, and she looked a little concerned. And I goes, "Oh my goodness, your computer doesn't go back that far." And <laughs> it just she just just looked up at me and smiled and and the whole re, whole interaction changed uh completely around and it was turned into a wonderful laugh, a wonderful experience and then you think once you know that person feels good then they're probably nice to the next person you know it just it's that snowball effect of good deeds kind of too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So tattoo, tattoos on the heart and barking to the choir. We've been talking about barking to the choir as a, an expert in young adult fiction, especially for Catholics. Is this a book that you would recommend for, um, uh, for families to experience together? Oh, absolutely. I don't have any kids at home right now. Um, youngest is off at college, but I was going to send it to all my kids because I think I, again, I wish they would have read it yet when they were younger because I think that just makes a difference on how you interact with everybody. Mm-hmm. And one thing that stuck out too was um, he said someone, there's a misperception that people join gangs because um, they're looking for something. And he said that is not why people join gangs. They do because they're fleeing from something. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of horrible abuse or something in their background and they're 
fleeing from that and they get caught up in these gangs. And I thought that is just something, a different way to think of it too, that, mm-hmm. you know, these people are hurting. And, um, and it, yeah, like you said, what's well, not necessarily that we have to go out and help the gangs people, uh, which would be wonderful, but just anybody in our lives uh, can use um, a helping hand, a smile, and to know that we connect with them and see them as a human. So I think it's a wonderful book for teens and adults. Yes, beautiful. Now, you said there were a number of things. Just before we go, are, is, are there any other uh, things in the book that really kind of stood out to you that you want to uh, uh, make folks aware of so that when they encounter it, they can go, ah, yeah, that's what Leslie was talking about. Well, there's just a couple that really stuck out, like finding happiness in the here and now mm-hmm. instead of, you know, searching for stuff. Every day in our little lives, um, there's something special and wonderful that you can focus on. I thought was nice. Um, and then he, there was a quote of his that I really liked that I'm going to write down and put up in my office somewhere. He said, I don't need God to be in charge of my life. I only need God to be at the center of it. And I thought that just sums it up. If he's uh, in the center, everything else kind of, we treat people different mm-hmm. and we see things a little differently. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. Well, we've had the pleasure of speaking today to our friend Leslie Wall. Now, Leslie, remind everybody of the wonderful books that you have written that folks are going to want to go out and check out uh, either right before or right after they check out Barking to the Choir. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, I have three books that are in print right now, uh, The Perfect Blind Side, An Unexpected Role, and Where You Lead. They're all young adult adventurous mysteries. And you also have a great, you're part of a great blog uh, of, of Catholic writers. Tell it, remind, remind us about that too, please. Yeah, uh, CatholicTeenBooks.com. It's a collection of authors. I think there's 13 or 14 of us now, and we all have books for teens in multiple genres, and it's just a great place to uh, find wonderful books for your family. Awesome. We've been talking today about Barking to the Choir by Father Greg Boyle. And our guest has been Leslie Wall. Leslie, thanks so much for being back. Thanks so much for having me. It was such a joy to read this. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We will be celebrating International Women's Day with an international interview. Kathy McMillan will be joining us from Baltimore, Maryland. And Manuela Bernardi will be joining us from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. They'll be speaking to us about their book, She Spoke, 14 Women Who Raised Their Voices and Changed the World. So excited about the next episode of the show. Hey, remember, if you would like to receive a free copy of either Tattoos on the Heart or Barking to the Choir by Father Greg Boyle, all you need to do is go to audibletrial.com slash respect, audibletrial.com slash respect. Sign up for the free 30-day trial membership, and you can download an audiobook for free. And hopefully you choose either Barking to the Choir or Tattoos on the Heart. There's also over 100,000 other titles for you to choose from. Cancel at any time during that first 30 days, and you owe absolutely nothing. And you get to keep the audiobook for free forever. AudibleTrial.com slash respect. Hey, want to thank Father Greg Boyle for being here today. We want to thank Leslie Wall for being here today. And, of course, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by developing that radical kinship with your family, with your kids. And you do that every time you choose to read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.